precious. All right. Ethics, core principles, four core principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. You need to know the definition of each, autonomy, you respect the patient as individuals, you honor and respect their decisions. Beneficence, you always act in the best interest of the patient. Non-maleficent, non-maleficence, sorry, avoid causing injury or suffering to patients. When you take the Hippocratic Oath, when you graduate med school, it says there, non primum nocere, first, do no harm. Justice, you need to treat patients fairly and equitably. Do you have an obligation to treat? Yes. When? Only on medical emergencies. When the life of a patient is in danger. You have a duty to treat. If you don't treat that patient, you are guilty of negligence. We're going to go to jail. Right? So, however, physicians are not obliged to treat a patient longitudinally. You can end a doctor-patient relationship. But what's the caveat? First, as long as the patient or your surrogate decision maker is notified and has the ability to establish care with another physician. Second, the patient or the surrogate decision maker has time and money you know, to establish care with another physician. And third, the physician is obligated to facilitate the transfer of care. You can end the doctor-patient relationship how first inform the patient second make sure that the patient has the ability to establish care with another physician third you as the physician is obligated to facilitate the transfer of care remember only us physicians future physicians and certain authorized persons persons are allowed to treat the patients Decision-making capacity versus legal competence. What's the difference? Decision-making capacity, this is determined by the physician, by you, right? It means the capability to, of the patient to process information, make decisions, and understand the consequences of the same with regard to health care. In order to have capacity, a patient must have understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and the ability to express a choice. Contrast this one with competence. Competence is assessed by a court of law. Only a law, only a court of law can tell you whether you're competent or not. It's a legal assessment of a patient's ability to make decisions. Where does the issue of legal competence arise? It arises in the presence of reduced mental capacity. For example, severe mental illness. If the patient is going to be institutionalized, intoxication, impulsivity, or constantly changing decisions. Right? So <clears throat> the difference, decision-making capacity, you the physician, you, you determine capacity. Competence only a court of law determines competence, okay? Shared decision-making and surrogate decision-making. Shared decision-making, that's the model with you and the patients, right? It empowers the patient, it is based on the patient's values, beliefs, and preferences. It results in better health outcomes and increases patient satisfaction. Now, what happens if the patient has um, lacks decision-making capacity or declared by a court to be incompetent? What happens? First, check if <clears throat> the patient has a will a medical power of attorney, the durable medical power of attorney, or a living will. Or there's a legally appointed surrogate, a court-ordered guardian, or next of kin. So high yield, you need to know the hierarchy of decision-making. Right? First, the patient, of course, when they're competent, and they have decision-making capacity. If there's nothing, right? If, if, if the patient is no longer competent, what happens? Check for advanced healthcare directive. Check for durable medical power of attorney, living will. Well, the patient has nothing, <clears throat> none of those. What's next? Next of kin, high yield, <clears throat> which who gets it to decide, right? First is always the spouse. The spouse has the right, followed by, if there's no spouse, adult child, adult child specifically the eldest for this. 
If nothing, then the parent. The parents are dead, the adult sibling, the brothers and sisters of the patient, with the eldest given preference, of course. And in about half of the states, someone called close friend. Okay? Now, sometimes, of course, when there's no surrogate that's available, there's a dispute. Right between the surrogates, there's a dispute. What are you going to do first as a physician if there is disagreement? So let them talk. Right, the first thing that you need to do is hold a family consult. Right? Let them talk with each other, and then make sure after still there's still discrepancy or there's still dispute, then you go to the court. That's the last resort. But the first thing that you need to do is let them talk to each other, all right? <clears throat> Next, don't forget the main principle here, right? Regardless of who the surrogate is, it is paramount that decisions be made based on what the patients themselves would have wanted. High yield, the decision maker, the surrogate decision maker should not let their own preferences influence decision making, right? Don't forget, sometimes you have an advanced directive or a living will. If there's a disagreement, what is the most prudent thing for a physician to do regarding the course of action, right? For example, um, the spouse is there, she wants to remove the feeding tube, the parents of the patient said, no, you need to, um, Put the feeding tube on with the patient. So what's the first thing that you need to do? First, family meeting. Right? Let them decide on their own. Let them talk with each other. And if there's still disagreement, what's next? The last resort, of course, is your to the courts. But first, you, you need to facilitate discussion between the different competing parties. Sometimes you, you, you can refer them to the ethics committee. Right, of the um, hospital. However, in the end, if it is determined that you have an appropriate surrogate decision maker, the decision maker, the, the decision of the surrogate decision maker should ultimately be followed. Okay. Full disclosure and medical errors. Do you have the right to full disclosure? Yes, the patient has the right to full medical disclosure. Does the family has the right to ask the physician to withhold information from a patient that is competent and has decision-making capacity? No, a family does not have the right to ask a physician to withhold information from a patient who's competent and has decision-making capacity. Except, one, the patient requests that the physician withholds the information. Two, therapeutic privilege. A physician determines that full disclosure would cause severe harm to the patient's severe psychological harm. This is controversial, but on the exam, you need to have, you need to fully disclose to your patient, okay? On the exam, full disclosure is the correct answer. It's always the correct answer. In terms of medical errors, do I need to report to the patient small medical errors that did that didn't result in harm to the patient. What do you think? This is small things that didn't really harm the patient. Yes. Yes, of course, you need to inform them, even though that error doesn't directly result in harm. It doesn't actually harm the patient. You need to first admit an error has occurred Full disclosure, as I've said, state the course of events that lead to and during the error. Remember, avoid jargon. You explain, you explain the error to the patient like they are in the fourth grade reading level, right? Avoid euphemism, avoid technical jargon. You explain the consequences of the error, if there are consequences. You describe corrective steps, right? You express regret and apology, of course and you allow ample time for questions and dialogue, right? You saw your colleague, 
right? Your soil colic commits an error in a patient's care. What are you going to do as a physician? First, what are you going to do um, first? Tell a supervisor. First, no, 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 first. What are you going to do first? You saw your colleague commit an error. Talk to the colleague? Exactly. So you talk to the colleague first. Tell him or her to report the error to the patient. What if he or she refuses? Your colleague refuses. What's the next one? Talk to supervisor. Then you can, yes, to the hospital or clinics. And then after that one, you can have investigations being carried out. So on the exam, full disclosure is always the correct answer, even for medical errors, even though it, it didn't result in patient harm. Now, in terms of research, we need to fully disclose to the um, to the patient if they're going to to go into a clinical trial. Everything, purpose of the study, study design, potential conflicts of interest, you have hazards, all of that um, things. You also need to disclose if you have um, con if you have conflicting interests to the um, patient. If you're receiving something, if they enroll this, if you if they enroll your patient into the clinical trial, you need to disclose. Okay, I, I'm going to receive ten percent like of the cash or something. You need to disclose that one. High yield, you need an informed consent form that is approved by the IRB, Institutional Review Board, okay, before initiation of treatment. And another high yield point, the patient has the right to withdraw from clinical trial anytime for any reason, okay? End of life care. So we have different ethical dilemmas. Contrast, compare and contrast physician-assisted suicide from euthanasia and terminal sedation. Physician-assisted suicide, a physician supplies a patient with the means to end their life. However, in this case, the patient self-administers that lethal medication. This is illegal in most states. I think Washington and Oregon is the only one that has that um, physician-assisted suicide is legal. Correct me if I'm wrong. Euthanasia, however, is the active termination of a terminally ill patient's life. A physician directly or actively injecting the lethal dose of morphine. This is illegal in the United States. Terminal sedation, on the other hand, is you're adjusting the medical therapy to provide relief from pain and suffering in a patient with terminal illness, despite hastening the patient's dying process. For example, you increase the dosage of morphine in a patient with metastatic cancer in a hospice care, right? That's terminal sedation. Then you ask, what's the difference between terminal sedation and euthanasia? The difference is intent, intention. In euthanasia, you have an intent of killing the patient, right? In terminal sedation, you don't have the intention. What is the primary purpose of terminal sedation? To relieve pain and suffering rather than bringing about the death, even though it may hasten the dying terminal sedation. DNR. What's DNR? You withhold cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You're in the hospital. You're a physician, right? There's a, there's a code. Then you're doing CPR. And then the nurse said, the patient is, has a DNR, DNI order. What are you going to do? There's a code. You're performing CPR. The nurse came in and says, the patient has DNR status. What are you going to do? Do not resuscitate. DNR. You stop. Stop. It's excellent because it's do not resuscitate. Do not perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation because if you did, and the pain, 
<laughs> Recovered. The patient might sue you. Remember, it's a DNR status. You don't perform CPR. And you did, even though the patient, and then the patient was alive. So make sure you know. Actually, in the hospital, on the chart, they're going to say DNR or your DNI. Do not intubate DNI or do not resuscitate. So orders. We're going to see that one. Is how about the withdrawal of care? Does the patient have the right to refuse any form of treatment at any time, even though it's beneficial to the patient? Yes. Even though the pay, even though the treatment would hasten the death of the patient, does, does the patient has the right to refuse that treatment? Yes, the principle of autonomy, right? However, what's the, what's the role, your role as the physician? You should make an effort to understand the reasons behind the patient's decision for refusing treatment. Futile <clears throat> treatment. Are you obligated as a physician, right, to give an inappropriate treatment to a patient, even the, the patient requested. For example, a patient came in and said, I'm afraid of COVID. Could you give me hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis for COVID? What are you going to say as a physician? Do you think hydroxychloroquine will work as a prophylaxis for COVID-19? What do you think? No. No. Right, it's a futile treatment, right? Based on New England Journal of Medicine, they did a trial, <clears throat> right? A good trial. Hydroxychloroquine doesn't work in prophylaxis, right? Prophylactically, it doesn't um, work. So, how can you determine <clears throat> if a treatment is futile or not? First, there is no evidence for effectiveness of treatment. You look at peer reviewed journals and you say there is no evidence there. You look at the meta-analysis, right? <clears throat> you look at the study, there's a meta-analysis and it says there is no um, evidence there. Second, if the intervention has previously failed, don't repeat the intervention again. If the antibiotic doesn't work, right? Don't prescribe the antibiotic again because it will not work, right? Next, if the last line therapy is failing, there is nothing else. That's the last line therapy. And then if the treatment will not fulfill the goals of care. So what's the point? A physician, you are not ethically obligated to provide treatment if it is considered futile. And how am I going to be, how am I going to assess if a treatment is futile? First, there's no evidence for the effectiveness of treatment. All right. You you learned that you you've learned biostatistics. You learned epidemiology. You learn how to de delineate good studies from bad studies, right? RCT. It should be RCT, random controlled, randomized controlled trials, right? It should be double blinded at least. The intervention has previously failed, or the last line therapy is failing, and if treatment will not fulfill the goals of a care, organ and tissue donation. So organ and tissue can be um, can be it um, for example for disease donors and um, living donors right so disease donors there's the person is dead obviously right and you look into the card and it says there on the on their living driving license oh the patient is organ and tissue donor. Should you just harvest the organ? Yes or no? You look into the car, right? You have a patient, it was in an accident, for example, and the patient is dead. You look into the card, you look into the driver's license, and it says there, organ donation. Are you going to get the organ now? Yes or no? You have to ask the family. Exactly. Always, always, right? Always ask the family. High yield. Hospitals that receive payment from Medicare, right? Mostly all of the hospitals, they receive payment from Medicare. You must discuss organ donation with the family, even though the card in the card, it says, oh, this is the driver's license. It says organ um, donor. However, the hospital must decline organs that are considered unsuitable. For example, if the patient has sepsis, right? They cannot accept um, organ donation from that um, patient. If the, the patient has prolonged organ ischemia, patient found disease um, at home or poor organ um, function. 
Now, those are disease donors. Always consult with the family. <clears throat> How about living donors? So living donors, what do you need to do? Inform consent. They must give full informed consent. Do they have the right? Question. <clears throat> um, did you say that it's only the when the payments from Medicare that they have to ask the family or always? I think always. Okay. Because most hospitals receive payment from Medicare, right? Oh. I don't think any hospital will, will refuse Medicare funding. Okay, right? so it's not if the patient's on Medicare. It's yeah. just that like if the hospital does receive yeah. payment from Medicare? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So for living donors, do they have the right to withdraw from donation at any time? Yes. Can the donors select the recipient of the donation? If I'm going to donate to someone, can I do that? Yes. Can the donor be paid for their donation? For example, $50,000 for a kidney. Can you advertise for that one? Can you do that? No. No. Okay, that's a high yield. They may not be paid for their donation. But here's the caveat. They can be reimbursed for associated costs. For example, travel, food, or lost wages. Okay? That's for the living donors. Not be paid for their organ donation, right? But they can be reimbursed for associated costs. Death. You as a physician, you're the ones who are going to determine death, the cost of death. So two types, brain death, cardiopulmonary death. Cardiopulmonary death, absence of heartbeat in asystolic patients. When you check the EKG, no P wave, no QRS complex, no T wave, and there is no heartbeat. Brain death. You have complete loss of function of the entire brain, including the brain stem where in the where in the brain stem can we find the respiratory center uh, let's go back to term two where medulla where, the medulla it also extends up to where the pons exactly so what group in the pons is responsible yeah. for breathing is it the dorsal respiratory group ventral Respiratory um, group. Actually, you have the DRG and then the VRG um, working together there. And where can we find the pre Botzinger nucleus, which controls exhalation and inhalation? Brainstem. Exactly. Excellent. So now remember, how are we going to determine brain death physiologically? Term two. No respiratory, um, like. Brain no death. effort. Brain death. We well, can do like a brain death study, right? Um, How are we going to do a brain that's death? That's an MRI. Okay. Check the activity of the Don't brain. Don't you also look like an, at an EEG for no brain wave activity? Exactly. Exactly. A brain um, wave. Exactly. Or check cerebral perfusion pressure. If you have a decrease in blood pressure and increase in intracranial pressure, what happens to cerebral perfusion pressure? decrease cerebral perfusion pressure. How are we going to determine cerebral perfusion pressure? MAP minus ICP, right? You remember mean arterial pressure from term one? What is that? SBP plus two times DBP, right? And you already know your ICP. If your CPP is equal to zero, it means brain death. That's, how, that's one of the ways that can you determine it physiologically by measuring the cerebral perfusion um, pressure. So two types of death, brain death, cardiopulmonary death. And you as the physician are the ones who are gonna determine what's the cause of um, death. Now, confidentiality, of course, all information is confidential. However, they're gonna test you on exceptions. What are the exceptions? First, the patient requests the physician to share the information with another party. Example, the family member or insurance um, purposes. Second, the patient has a notifiable disease. We're going to talk about notifiable diseases on the next um, slide. If the patient has a notifiable disease, right, that you need to notify the public health official, you as a physician, you should encourage your patient to inform any third parties that may have been infected. However, high yield 
you as a physician does not have the right to inform third parties without the patient's consent. If the patient has a notifiable disease, you tell the patient the only one that can know about this is the CDC or a public health official. You encourage the patient to tell any third parties involved that they have been infected. But you as a physician does not have the right to inform those third parties without the patient's consent. So you need the consent of the patient. And anyways, the public health official, the CDC, is will gonna notify will gonna notify the third parties involved, anyways. So next exception, the patient poses a danger to others. If the patient said, Oh, I want to kill someone like this, like that, you need to protect the victim of homicide. So you need to call the police and need to notify that that page that person that your patient is trying to harm. That's imperative of you as a physician. Or confidentiality is um, can be overcome if you have the patient poses a threat to himself or herself. If the patient wanted to kill himself or herself and has plans, then you institutionalize them. You hold him in the hospital. Right, for a maximum of, of, I think, 72 hours, it depends. And then there's elder abuse and child maltreatment. You need to report that to the protected Child Protective Services, right? For elder abuse and child maltreatment. Or the patient has suffered penetrating trauma from assault, like a gunshot wound or a stab wound, and the patient is a minor, and care does not involve sexual or addiction um, medicine. So high yield point, confidential information should only be shared with other healthcare workers if they are involved in the patient's care. If they are not involved in the patient's care, then it's a no-no, no bueno for that one. You need to avoid discussing patient information in public areas. When you go to the hospital, you look at the, um, look at the walls, some of the elevators that they said there, oh, avoid discussing patient information in public um, areas. So let's summarize confidentiality. What are what the exceptions? First, if the patient says yes, go ahead, share the information. Second, the patient has notifiable disease. The only thing that can know about this is the public health official. You don't have the right to inform third parties without the patient's consent. Third, the patient poses a danger to others. If the patient is homicidal, the patient wants to kill someone, or it's an impaired driver, you need to protect the victim, the intended victim, by notifying the police and calling that intended victim. Next, the patient poses a threat to himself or herself. Institutionalize the patient. Elder abuse and child maltreatment. You need to tell the uh, protective services, elderly and child protective services, if there is a hint of abuse. Just, just a hint of abuse, it's okay. Next, the patient has suffered penetrating trauma from assault and the patient is a minor. Now, high yield, the notification of diseases, the infectious diseases, okay? So these are HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, hepatitis, tuberculosis, rabies, meningococcal meningitis. So, What's the point here? If you want to hook up and you're using Tinder, right? Make sure you use protection. That's why they're there. Most of these are sexually transmitted infections. Remember, patients must be informed that their disease is reportable. You need to tell the patient, hey, man, I need to report this to the CDC. And you should encourage them to inform any third parties involved. Right? And remember, the public health department is responsible for notifying third parties if the patient refuses to inform them. Next, elder abuse, child abuse. Elder abuse, signs and symptoms, malnutrition, unexplained cuts, depression, muscle property. You are, as the physician, legally obliged to report suspected. Remember the keyword, even though it's, it's suspected only, you have. You are legally and ethically obligated to report suspected elder abuse. Also for child abuse, the same thing, okay? 
even though it's suspected, you have just a hint, right? You have just a hint. Talk about the term one for child maltreatment. What's the hint in the vignette that it's child abuse and not osteogenesis imperfecta? Different phases of the bruise healing or wound healing. Exactly, exactly. So different stages of bruising in the vignette. When you hear, when you see that in the vignette, think it's not osteogenesis imperfecta. It is child abuse. And you as a physician, you need to report that. Domestic violence. Okay, <clears throat> domestic violence. <clears throat> We call this one if it's in, if it involves um, between partners in a relationship, intimate partner violence. So what are we going to do? Okay, patient came in, <clears throat> she is crying. The partner is in the room. So you as a physician, you enter. What are you going to do? You suspect domestic violence. What are you going to do first? Get the patient um, like by themselves with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell the tell the husband to leave the room. Excellent. So you need to speak privately with the patient, right? And you offer assistance. Are you, as a physician, legally permitted to report domestic violence without patient consent? Yes or no? Are you legally permitted to report domestic violence without the patient consent? What are we thinking? No. No. So physicians are not legally permitted to report domestic violence without patient consent unless the patient is incompetent, right? In cases where the patient refuses aid, if the patient says, no, I don't want you to report this, so you're not gonna report it, right? What are, what, what, are, what are you going to do as a physician? You should reiterate your support of the patient and the availability of aid at any time. So the point here is physicians are not legally permitted to report domestic violence without patient consent unless the patient is incompetent. For example, mentally disabled or a minor or elderly where they can't give their full consent. What if we have a patient? Imagine you have a patient here and the patient has uncontrolled epilepsy. Can you report that patient to the DMV or to any licensing authority? Yes, you can report them. So you can report patients who are considered unsafe to drive to the licensing authority. You as a physician, you should suggest another means of transportation, okay? So those patients who are having frequently poorly controlled seizures, yes, you report them. Recent history of seizures, yes, but you need to report them. Prisoner execution, don't forget, even though death penalty is legal, in the United States, it is not ethical for physicians to participate in any executions, regardless of state law that enforce the death penalty. Even though death penalty is legal in the United States, you are not ethically, right? It's not ethical for you as a physician to participate in any executions whatsoever. <clears throat> ah, now, imagine this one. You have a patient, right? Now, you've seen this patient for a while and she looks nice, right? She's hot. She looks like Bella Hadid, right? La Bellissima. And you think that you're starting to develop feelings with her, right? And um, you wanted to shoot your shot, right? You're thirsty, you're both thirsty. So should you date your patient? Yes or no? What do you think? No. <laughs> okay, what if, wait a minute, we're talking about the lookalike of Bella Hadid here. What if I transfer her care to another physician? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, you still can't. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, there is um, there's some exceptions there, right? But anyways, 
for for the boards for the boards romantic relationship with current patients are always unethical and inappropriate why remember it compromises your objectivity as a physician of course it makes your patients more vulnerable to exploitation you're in the position of trust you're in a position of authority right don't forget that do not exploit your patient do not be like dr larry nassar Romantic relationship with former patients are also inappropriate if the physician has a position of influence from his or her previous professional experience, right? Or less than one year has passed since the end of the patient-physician relationship. Always, 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 right? The physician should take active measures to avoid unnecessary contact with the patient. Especially male physicians, if we're doing our rotation, specifically an OBGYN, and you're doing a vaginal exam, you always need to have a chaperone present there, a female nurse, for example, or a female colleague there. Okay, so you use direct close-ended questions. You interview with a chaperone um, present. Okay, now torture, torture. Remember, a physician should act always in the best interest of the patient. So you refuse to participate in torture. You need to provide all the possible support to aid the patient and facilitate the patient's removal from harm. Uh, now, controversial topics, abortion and still birth. Abortion is legal in the United States. Roe versus um, Wade, first trimester, although they, um, they abandoned the trimester period in Casey, um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. They are now using viability as an, um, of, the, of the fetus, viability of the fetus in order to know if you can abort the fetus or not. So they vary greatly in the US. Check for your state law for this. They only permit a licensed physician to perform um, abortions if the mother's life or health is at risk because of the pregnancy, and it is up to a certain gestational age. Question, what if I'm a physician, right? And I'm morally opposed to abortion, and a patient came to see me and she wanted to have an abortion. What should I do? What should you do as a physician? You can refer her to someone else if you feel it's not um, instilled with your morals. Exactly. Excellent. So physicians, most states, the caveat, most states, they allow physicians to refuse performing abortions under the condition. There's a condition, though. Whatever your reasons are, it's okay, right? However, the condition is you refer that woman to another physician who is skilled and willing to perform abortions. Remember, patient counseling Prior to abortion, it's mandatory in some states. So this is this differs from the um, states. Most states require that parents of minors undergoing an abortion procedure are notified and or informed to provide consent. Basically, for abortion in Roe versus Wade, the court says that the woman has the right to her own body. That's the underpinning of the abortion laws in the United States. Now, malpractice, as I've said before, you have a duty to treat and you didn't do anything to save that patient's, patient's life. Are you liable? Yes, you're liable. Why? Medical negligence. So you're going to get a civil suit of negligence due to a substandard of care. Informed consent. What constitutes an informed consent? There's a lot, actually. First, the language. Make sure that the patient understands the language. The timeline, make sure that before performing a procedure on an elective um, surgery, they must be informed with a sufficient time interval. And then you need to tell them everything, diagnosis, treatment options, risk and benefits. And then make sure that you give time for the patient to um, question you, to ask some questions, right? And once the patients have been briefed, they must be provided with adequate time to digest that information. And then in the end, 
you need to accept the patient's decision if they're going to accept or not the intervention that you're proposing. Are there exceptions to the standard of informed consent? Yes, there are exceptions. This is a high yield. First, life-threatening emergencies. For example, unconscious trauma patient without a surrogate decision maker. In terms of emergency, treat. Go ahead. Go and treat the patient because you have a duty to treat. If you don't treat the patient, civil suit malpractice. <laughs> Next, there is um, a patient, but the patient lacks decision-making capacity, but he, the patient has a surrogate decision maker. And the surrogate decision maker authorized the intervention. So that's okay. Now, next, if the patient's decision to refuse treatment poses a safety risk to their own well-being and or welfare of others, this is high yield, you can invalidate the informed um, consent. For example, in the patient, in the event of a severe psychosis of a patient, or the patient has active TB, which is reportable to the CDC. Informed consent in minors. Do you need parental consent in most things? Uh, yes. However, there are few exceptions. High yield. What are the exceptions? First, if the treatment is life-saving, you don't need parental consent. If the treatment is emergent and life-saving, you don't need parental consent. Second, if the minor is legally emancipated, the minor is living on his or her own the minor is legally emancipated. Next, the minor is seeking care regarding sex. You don't need parental consent, for example, contraception, pregnancy care, or STIs, or addiction care. Next, what if the parents of the patient are minors themselves? Who gives consent? The grandparents may give consent for their grandchildren. So even in these situations, even you don't give um, parental consent, remember, you should still encourage the minor to discuss their issues with their parents. Now, question. What if a patient refuses treatment to a child for a non-emergent but fatal medical condition? What's the first thing that you're going to do as a physician? I am the parent and I said, no, I don't consent for this. What are you going to do first? I guess you would counsel them first and try and try and get them to consent. So the first thing first, of course. So in the vignette, when you're doing ethics questions, they'll can ask you, what are you going to do first? Read the vignette carefully. So as I've said, you facilitate discussion. You need to ask questions with the patient. Why do you think? Right, discuss the decisions with the parent, right? Why, why are you refusing this um, treatment to your child? And then they're gonna tell you the reasons, whatever. And then the last resort is always a court order, mandating treatment if parents continue to refuse. High yield point, a parent cannot refuse an emergently life-saving intervention for a minor. A parent cannot refuse, and if it's an emergency, the parent cannot refuse an emergency life-saving intervention for a minor. Can a pregnant woman refuse healthcare even if it poses a risk to the unborn fetus, even if it causes the death of the fetus? Can a pregnant woman has the right to refuse healthcare? that can result in the death of the unborn fetus? Yes or no? <clears throat> Anyone? Yes. Yes, Ex excellent. So they can refuse healthcare, even if that decision poses a risk to the unborn fetus, right? They have the right to their own bodies. Remember that ethical principle. Conflicts of interest, of course, you as a physician, you need to tell your patient if you have conflicts of um, interest. Can you accept gifts, like small gifts, like food, for example? Can you accept that from your patient? Oh, the doc, uh, have some macaroons. 
Can you accept those kinds of gifts? Small gifts. Yes. Yes, small gifts are okay. What if the patient says, oh, doc, since you're a good doctor, he's a, he's a Lamborghini Huracan. I think it just has to be less than $100. <laughs> if it's a Hot Wheels car, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that works. <laughs> I said, why not? And then diagnose the patient with dementia afterwards. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So patients may offer gifts to you. Don't accept gifts of inappropriately high value. Okay. That's the point. Now let's go over some ethically challenging situations. Now. An adult patient came in and the patient says, you, you diagnose the patient and you give the intervention. And the patient says, I'm sorry, but the intervention you are um, telling me, it's against my deeply held religious belief. So the question is, what's you're going to do first as a physician? Ask them about their beliefs. <clears throat> okay, so why do you think that um, you explain the treatment option, right, and other alternatives to the to your patient? Make sure that the patient understands the consequences. And after all of that, after all the explanation, after all of the um, making sure that the patient understands the consequences, you respect, right? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, as Aretha Franklin once said. You need to respect the patient's choice. Okay, a patient came in. And um, the patient said, um, I want to try some alternative medicine. I'm, uh, I'm depressed. I need to try St. John's Word. I think St. John's Word is effective, doctor. So what are you going to do first? Ask the patient why they want to use it. Exactly. So first, identify the reason why. Should you negate or devalue the patient's idea? Nah, it doesn't work. Don't tell me that crap. You only Google that one. I'm the medical doctor. I have four years of medical education. Of course not. The point here is you evaluate that alternative um, medicine for any drug interactions, adverse effect, and if it is safe, you allow treatment integration, okay? Allow treatment integration. Do not negate or devalue the patient's idea. Why? It will affect the phys patient-physician relationship. Okay, abuse. Patient came in and the patient discloses to you that, um, being abused by a close partner. What are you going to do? So show empathy, willingness, right? Evaluate safety and presence of an emergency plan. Perform thorough documentation that's high yield. Why? Because the victim might want to take legal measures, okay? A pediatric patient has injury inconsistent with caregiver's report. What are you going to do? You, are, you need to inform authorities, okay? You are obliged to report cases of child abuse. Confidentiality. Family members request information about patient's health condition. Can you give the family member the info without the consent of the patient? No, you need the consent of the patient. The patient with HIV refuses to inform his or her partner. What are you going to do first as a physician? You counsel the patient to disclose the info, and then you inform the health department, and then the health department will gonna inform third parties involved. Parents refuse life-saving treatment for their child. Can they refuse treatment in an emergency? Yes or no? No. No. So if it's emergency, go ahead and treat. If it's non-emergency, 
if it's non-emergent, can parents refuse a treatment for a child in a non-emergency? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yes. A 16-year-old pregnant teenager wants to have an abortion. So for this one, many states require parental consent, actually. So it depends upon the state. For an abortion in <coughs> minors, right? A 15-year-old teenager wants to keep her baby against her parents' will. Remember, the patient has the right to decide about her baby's fate. Right? So you provide practical information about all options and you support the patient irrespective of her decision. A 14-year-old came in and she requests contraceptives. What are you going to do as a physician? A minor came in and he or she requests for contraceptives. What are you going to do? You give them the contraceptives. Exactly. And what else? Aside from giving them the contraceptives. Encourage them to uh, have open dialogue with their parents. Exactly. Excellent. That's, that's the key thing. Educate the patient about safe sex practices. And also praise the patient, you know, that um, she's, um, he or she is using right, contraception. Praise the patient and advise them on safe sex practices, and prescribe the contraceptives. You do not need to notify the parents to get the consent. What if the patient, a patient came in and I'm suicidal or homicidal? A patient came in and I said, I wanted to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. I have this gun at home. Um, what are you going to do? The patient is suicidal. You can admit them involuntarily. You can admit them involuntarily if patient refuses. If the patient is homicidal, you need to inform authorities and the individual, the threatened individual. What if the patient receives wrong treatment or wrong test? You need to inform the patient and apologize. What if there's an angry patient, right? Waiting at the office for a long time, the Karens of this world, okay? who thinks the world owes them something. So what are you going to do? The patient is angry. What are you going to do? I've been waiting here for a long time. First, apologize. Acknowledge the anger and do not justify or explain the delay, right? Do not justify or explain the delay. If a patient desires an unnecessary intervention. What are you going to do first as a physician? Find out why the patient wants the intervention and then avoid performing unnecessary intervention. And do not refuse to see the patient or refer them to another physician. The patient has poor adherence or difficulty of taking medications. So you add first, what are you going to do first as a physician? Identify the cause of non-adherence Evaluate willingness to change, describe treatment plan, and do not refer the patient to another physician, right? And label them, oh, non-compliant. Physician is impaired in work environment. The patient um, drank a lot of vodka and he came to work. He's impaired. What are you going to do as the physician? If you determine that the physician is a threat to the safety, of his patient, you should report him to your supervisor, to a supervisory entity, and they're gonna enroll him into a physician health uh, program. If that if that still doesn't work and the physician is still drinking, then the state licensing board needs to be informed. So you're in the hospital, you're a medical student, and the patient asks you to disclose any treatment, diagnostic, or prognostic information. What are you going to do? as a medical student. Next year, you're gonna be in the hospital as a medical student. And then the patient says, could you tell me what's, um, what's my test? What's the result of my test? 
What are you going to do as a medical student? The, the like a, sorry, the physician will tell them. So I guess you would like let the patient know that the physician will inform them. Okay, maintain honesty, right? Always act in the best interest of the patient. You inform the patient that complex treatment plans or diagnostic information will be disclosed by senior members of the team. That's always a good excuse. Tell them that complex treatment plans or diagnostic info will be disclosed by senior members of the team, right? Maintain honesty, right? If the information is available, tell them, okay, the test is here. And then explain why the disclosure has been postponed because it will be disclosed by the senior members of the team. Page parents who refuse to vaccinate their child, the anti-vaxxers, right? They're people too. What are you going to do if the parent refuses to vaccinate their um, child? So first, respect the decision of the parent and address their concerns. If in the multiple choices, there's address their concerns, pick that one. That's the first thing that you should do. You provide the reliable information. Tell them the article from Lancet was retracted, right? A couple of years um, back. There, there's a research that links vaccine with autism. It was published in Lancet. It was later retracted because it's a lie. Re revisit the topic in the subsequent visits. And in exceptional, in exceptional cases, although this is not warranted, right? Adopt coercive uh, measures. But for this one, always respect the parent's decision and address their concerns. What if a family member of, of, or a close friend requests a drug prescription from you? A, a close friend, family member, they say, hey, could you please give me a prescription for this? What are you going to do? Do not perform any treatment or make prescriptions for close family members. However, in emergency situations, Treatment should be given regardless of the relationship to the patient. Okay, four rules of doctoring questions on step one. What are we going to do for ethics, right? First, anything that sounds the least bit rude and sensitive or unprofessional should be ruled out right away. Right away. If it's rude and sensitive, unprofessional, ruled out right away. Any option that includes referring the patient to another provider, referring patients to another source of info, or seeking legal ethical counsel is wrong. Remember, all of the questions given are things you need to be able to figure out yourself. Third, always try to get more information from your patient. Don't jump to diagnostic tests or treatments before you have the full picture. Always ask, why do you think that is? Right? Get a complete history first. Whenever there is an option like tell me more about or why do you feel that way about, that's the right answer. Next, any statements centered on the physician are wrong. Please don't bring your beliefs, desires, or feeling into the answer. The answer choices need to be focused on the patient and their family. So those are the rules questions on your exam and also on step one. You ready for some questions? Can you see this question? Yes. Okay, shoot, go ahead. Who's the volunteer? What are we thinking? Who's going to represent Capital City? <laughs> I was thinking B. B. Call the patient at once to deliver the news that his results were normal. You all agree? I'm between C and D. 
Mm -hmm. Call the patient to deliver the news and schedule him for a follow-up appointment to review and he can do to improve his overall health. Have the practices nurse call the patient to deliver the news and take time to answer any questions you may have. Remember, the patient is anxious, visibly upset, and inconsolable about the possibility of having a cancer. So what is the most appropriate next step in patient care? And no one else? Anyone wants to jump in? Who's going to be Katniss? I was thinking C2. Who's Katniss? Who's going to be the girl on fire? Or the boy on fire? So you're torn between B, C, and D. Okay? Let's see the correct answer. C. Okay? All communication with the patient is best handled face-to-face. When this is not possible because of the need to deliver news in a timely manner, as in the present case, the phone conversation should be followed up by a visit. Okay? The follow-up visit is needed to discuss some of the patient's other health issues. So C, call the patient to deliver the news and schedule him for a follow-up appointment to review what he can do to improve his overall health. Right? Next. <laughs> wow, you've got great hands, Doc. Just having you touch me makes me feel better. <laughs> and the physician is thirsty. Careful, it's a thirst trap. What are we going to do? I was thinking F. F. So tell the patient, right? You will not pursue any social relationship with her, but he would like to continue to be her physician. Okay, any other answer? I think I'm, I'd go with F too. But Nick, what would you do if it was uh, Bella Hadid? <laughs> then yes. <laughs> She's worth losing my medical license for. We can live off her uh, modeling money, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So F, right? F. Okay. Any answers? Any other answers? Do we all agree that it's F? Yeah. Do we all agree? You have any doubts? Okay. Let's see. The correct answer is F, of course. Physicians should not have sexual or social relationship with their patients. So don't go liking her pictures on Instagram or TikTok or Snap, okay? Don't slide into her DMs, period. That's absolute, All right? Next question. <clears throat> This is a good question. Very good question. What are we thinking here? I want to see your thought. Uh, C, because you have to triage the patients. Mm. Okay. Someone said C, quickly assess both patient's injuries and provide immediate medical attention to the patient with the most serious injuries. Do you all agree? I agree. I agree. You all agree? Yes. Not E? Treat the child for the so that he can be prosecuted for his crime. <laughs> okay, so you said C because you need to triage. Right? Or why not B? Give priority to the 12 year old girl. But attempt to treat both patients simultaneously. So your answer is C. Let's see. Of course, it's um, C. Right? So 
in the ED, 12-year-old child, and a child molester, and then you need to determine the most appropriate action. So you need to analyze the answer choices and you need to triage, right? You need to triage the patient, which one is the worst? You treat that person first. So the answer is C. Next. They're worried about their son, right? Their son is having erratic behavior. Which of the following is the most appropriate response by the physician to the parents? What are we thinking? E. E. Or A, I'm between those two. E and A. Before I give A, before I give you a diagnosis, I need to talk to your son a bit more. What's the value of, of um, A as, as the answer? It's patient focused. Okay. And you need to get more from the patient, right? You need to elicit information from the patient. How about you said E? Yeah, that one I was thinking just because like. Attractive. What makes E attractive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What makes E attractive? The fact that that would be a more specialized physician to make a diagnosis. Okay. Uh -huh. But remember, you are transferring his scare to another, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. What else? Anyone else? What's your answer? Look at the signs and symptoms. I mean, it sounds like schizophrenia, so I was thinking yeah, term F. Two, right? Term two, people. Disorganized speech, difficulty understanding. He discusses, you have flight of ideas, you have the moon, fishing for crabs, and how dirty is fingernails. Then you have humming to himself. So what are we thinking? I was thinking F. Okay. F. What makes F attractive to you? What makes that um, choice attractive? Well, you're establishing what you think it is, but then you're also trying to see what they think about the, the disease. Excellent. So you're, you're getting information, right, from the parents. Excellent. Another? Any other answers? Okay, that's it. Let's see. Actually, it's F. Exactly. So you already, before discussing treatment options, you need to talk with the family about the patient's diagnosis. First, collect info, then diagnose, and then you treat. In this case, do we have enough information to arrive at the diagnosis? Do we have in the vignette? Do you have it? Yes. You can see the signs of schizophrenia, right? What are the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia, by the way, from term two? Anyone? Isn't it one core uh, symptom longer than, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, it's fine. One core symptom longer than six months. Mm -hmm. So like- um, We have? Like disorganized behavior. Yes. Um, Hallucinations, delusions, yeah, hallucinations. organized speech, uh, contrast this one with schizophrenia form, which is less than six months, and a brief psychotic disorder. Which, um, which, limbic, which part of the limbic system is increased in schizophrenia? Mesolimbic or mesocortical? From term two, don't forget, please, your neuro. Well, isn't it the positive symptoms is yes. mesocortical? Uh, right? Actually, a mesolimbic. Or I mix, oh, I missed that up. For positive symptoms. And for mesocortical, a decrease in that for your 
negative um, symptoms. But anyway, that's term two. Please don't forget, because term five, we're going to have BSCE2. Everything will going to come back again. So for this one, it's F, because you have, you can diagnose the patient. And then you need to elicit much info from the parents. What do you know about schizophrenia? Excellent. Next one. I have a question about that question, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I understand why like you can get to the diagnosis and stuff, but do you not need to talk to the patient to see like their side, like what's going, what they feel is going on, like what's going on with them? But you have a psychiatric consult that says the patient is exhibiting erratic movement and gait. You cannot, if, if you're trying to elicit more information from the patient, what if the patient has, um, in the, um, you, know, you know the patient has mesolimbic, right? So increase in mesolimbic. So you have this, mm -hmm. you have this organized speech and his thought process is, is not that great. So how are you going to elicit more information in that um, patient? Okay, I get it. Thank you, know you. What I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah fair. In the fair. vignette, it says his speech is disorganized. And then you have some things there, talking, he stops, and then he hums to himself, right? So to have the patient has erratic behavior. So you can't actually, even if you talk to the patient, you can't actually get more info from the, from the patient. You cannot refer them to a psychiatrist because you already know that the consult says the patient has erratic movements. And gate. All right. I'm sorry about that. Um, next one. These are good questions, actually. Mm-hmm. What are we thinking? I know he's in a better place, but I feel so lonely here without him. So these are the kinds of questions that we're going to see in your ethics. Which of the following is the most appropriate response? Or they're going to say, which of the following is the first response that you're going to do as a physician? So they can play with these um, questions. D. D is in Delta. Yeah. I'm sure you miss him terribly. Have you had thoughts about taking your own life? Why do you think D is an attractive answer? Because you would have to um, distinguish like the imminent risk of it. Because I guess if you went with B and then they went home and killed themselves, you would be liable. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I guess for B, if you said B, if they do have a support system, then they're uh -huh. less likely to kill themselves. Ah. Um, okay. But I guess you most can, um, think about the question. Most appropriate response. I think B. B, as in boy. Oh. Certainly, this is a challenging time for you. Do you have any friends or family who may be able to stay with you? Okay. Any other answer? Actually. The answer is D. What's D? I'm sure you miss him terribly. Have you had thoughts about taking your own life? Because as someone said, this presents a woman who is either having a normal grief reaction or suffering from major depression. Right? Regardless of your diagnosis, it is imperative for you as the physician to assess suicidal ideation in this patient. The consequences for failing to do so could be catastrophic, okay? So you know that this case, it can either be the patient has a normal grief reaction or is suffering from a major depression. And you know that if you're suffering from an MDD or a normal grief reaction, you need to assess for suicidal ideation, right? So you need always to assess suicidal ideation in this patient. So someone said, 
The correct answer is D. Next question. We're almost there, I promise. I think we're gonna end like, um, have a couple more questions, but we can end early if you want to. Arrange to speak with the boy and ask him the reasons for his. Why do you think A? What makes that option attractive? Because you would want to find out why the patient is feeling this way. Okay. Well, you facilitate discussion with the patient to elicit more information from the patient. Okay. Any other answers? So all of you agree it's A? Don't be shy, any other answers? I mean, I guess the other answer I was thinking of was E because he's still a minor. Okay, 15 year old. So speak with the child's mother to discuss her thoughts on her son's decision. And then ask, don't forget the caveat there, and then ask how she would like to um, proceed. So someone's saying E because he's still a minor, right? What are we thinking? A and E. Anyone? Any other answers? Before you reveal the answer. Three, two, one, it's A. So before reaching any treatment recommendation or encouraging either the parents or the boy, the physician needs to need more information. So the boy is old enough to express himself and articulate his reasons. So the physician should go directly to the source. So remember for rule in your exam and for USMLE, getting enough info before taking any action is a good rule to remember for the USMLE and for your medical practice. So you need more information, right? So the correct answer is arrange to speak with the boy and ask him what are the reasons for you for his decision. Is there a specific age we should know where it changes from like the patient being able to um, kind of think their own thoughts versus the parents being like our first route? I think the, if the patient is an emancip, emancipated minor and the patient is asking for guidance regarding those four things, right? Um, for contraception, you don't need parental um, consent and all of that. So you have you have different um, ex except, exceptions that um, we, we've talked about. I think that's the only thing that's um, viable. Okay. Right. Because for this one, the patient decided. Right. So the caveat here is this: the patient has decided he would like to stop taking his asthma, despite whinings from his mother about stopping the medication. So you want to know the reason why. Why does um, the, the, the boy decided not to take his asthma medication, right? So you need to speak with the boy and ask him for the um, reasons, right?
So this is a clinical trial. And you think that the patient is an excellent candidate for the study. However, remember, the representative explains that the fee covers the physician's time spent to explain and subsequently refer the patient to the surgery. So you have a secondary gain. So what are you going to do? So you have a secondary gain. C. Again? Would it be C? C. I agree. Discuss the clinical trial with the patient and fully disclose the physician's financial arrangement with the pharmaceutical company. Do you all agree? Three, two, one. No, it's not the correct answer is E. So what is E? Let's look at E. Discuss the clinical trial with the patient and disclose the offer of an administrative fee, but decline the fee and inform the patient of that decision. So you discuss the trial with the patient and disclose the offer of an administrative fee, full disclosure, but you tell them I decline the fee and inform the patient of that decision. Remember, payment for referrals, even for study, even when the payment is disclosed, it is a breach of ethics, right? So professional judgment must not be clouded by other considerations, including secondary gain or financial um, incentives. The, clinic, the clinical trial is right for the patient, yes? So he should be referred. But the modest administrative fee, in the vignette, it is a bribe in disguise and must be refused. In addition, the patient must be fully informed about the circumstances surrounding the referral, including the offer of the administrative fee. Furthermore, the receipt of any gift, right, is also considered to be unethical. An example of a token gift would be um, homemade. It's okay to, to get homemade baked goods. That's okay. You can accept that. A thank you card. That's, um, you can accept that one, or other nominal handcrafted items. So full disclosure and refuse the modest administrative um, fee, okay? Next question. Do you want me to go on or do you want me to stop? If you're going somewhere, Go on. Go on? <laughs> All right. But also, it's been like over four hours. So if you personally need to go, like, it's fine. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> That's all your time as well. That's all right. It's my break for studying for today. I have one break a week. <laughs> Okay, what are we what are we thinking here? All right? You have a six to seven year old man, uh -huh. poor appetite, weight loss. His wife died two months ago from cancer, and he has a great deal of guilt. Maybe he didn't treat her well when she's still alive, and feels that he could have done more at the end. Which is the most appropriate initial response, okay? Most appropriate initial response for the physician. What are we thinking? C. Someone's C. Tell me more about your, what do you think that's attractive? Because you're gathering more information from the patient about how they feel. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Any other answers? How about B? I'm sure you did everything you could. Nobody could have saved her. Is that an attractive answer? If no, why not? <clears throat> what are we thinking? That looks attractive, right? So 
So all of you telling me it's um, C, correct? Because you need more info from the patient. Is that correct? Yes? Three, two, one. Yep, it's correct. It's C. So when a person loses someone who's close to them, you need to talk about the loss. Tell me more about your feelings about your wife's death. Is the only statement that encourages the patient to talk. Next question. So you have a woman who's taking carbamazepine. And then you know that carbamazepine decreases OCPs, right? Oral contraceptives, the effectiveness of your OCPs. That's why. And then two days later, the patient says, the pharmacist said that taking this medication might decrease the effectiveness of my birth control pills. Why would you prescribe me this drug? Which is the most appropriate response for the physician? A. I'm sorry. This is my fault because I should have discussed this issue with you when I prescribed the medication. Any other? What do you think that's attractive? Um, it gives, well, it holds himself accountable and you should have had full disclosure about it. But okay. These are the side effects. Okay. You have to discuss risk and benefits. Okay. Any other answers? Remember, the most appropriate response for the physician. Based on like the ethics of it, I feel like it's G, even though it seems like a weird answer. Okay, someone is saying G. You seem angry. Why don't you tell me why you are so upset by this, right? By this. Hmm, interesting. So you want more from the patient, right? The patient is angry. She's screaming at you, right? And then you say, you seem angry. Why don't you tell me why you are so upset by this? Okay, any other answer? Three, two, one. It's A. So always admit a mistake. In this case, the physician made a mistake in not discussing the interaction of the new prescription with other drugs the patient was taking. So the correct answer, as someone said it a while ago, starts by admitting the mistake and apologizing. Move on to provide the necessary info and closes by admitting the mistake again. Remember, we are only human beings, right? And we do make mistakes. Most mistakes can be discussed openly and then corrected. Why are we going to admit the mistake? Because it strengthens the physician-patient relationship. Next question. So you have my people in the room, right? 76 year old Filipino woman. She had three hospitalizations over the last two months. And then a certified staff interpreter is present, of course, to communicate in her language, Tagalog. And then the physician begins to take interval history using the interpreter. Which of the following is the most appropriate communication technique during the visit? What are you thinking? E. E. Look directly at the patient rather than the interpreter while conducting the visit. Why do you think it's E? What makes it attractive? Um, I what? think when you right. use an interpreter, you're supposed to pretend like 
kind of like they're not there. Like you're talking to the patient Perfect. like Thank normally. You. Yep, excellent. Any other answers? No. It's E. Three, two, one. It is E. The principles of good interpersonal interpersonal communication apply to all patients, regardless of limited English proficient, proficiency or if an interpreter is being used. So you address your questions directly to the patient, keeping eye contact with him or her. Make sure that when you talk to the patient, you are facing each other while the interpreter remains unobtrusive as possible. And you need to use open-ended questions, checking to ensure the patient understands and inquire about patient's uh, concerns. Excellent, so it's E. This treatment is not working. It's such a pain. I don't want to come here anymore. I don't think you know what you're doing. Mm. Which of the following is the most appropriate response by the physician? E. E as in egg? Yeah. So in what way is the treatment not wrong? Oh, why do you think it's E? Um, because you want to know, like, what about the treatment the patient's having, like, um, issues with? Exactly, because they're non-compliant with the with the treatment, right? So you need to know more info. You need to elicit more info from the patient. That's always a good approach. Any other answers? And we're thinking, are we all thinking E? Yes? Oh, yeah, okay. I agree. You all agree? Uno, dos, tres. It is E. So the key issue here is that the physician does not know exactly what is bothering the boy when he says the treatment is not working. Does he think he should be cured or does he find the monitoring and treatment regimen to be onerous or cumbersome? Is he receiving criticism from his peers, right? Or is he just tired of having a medical problem? So when you don't know exactly what the patient is talking about, you need to ask, right? Ask and you shall receive. Knock, it shall be open unto you, according to the good book. Okay, next. I, the patient says, I only made an appointment so that I could spend time alone with you. Mm. Is she worth losing your medical license for? That's the question. <laughs> what are we thinking? I was thinking B. Me too. B. In order to provide medical care for it, it's important to maintain strict professional um, boundaries. Is that it? Do you all agree or you don't? Why not stop the encounter immediately and exit the room? Why not E? It's a little rude. And that would be unprofessional. Right? And root. So <clears throat> you all agree it's B? So it is B, 
right? Again, a doctor should never develop a romantic relationship with a patient. Next question. What's the answer? Full disclosure or no? So wouldn't it be a? You gotta let every, You gotta let them know. Mm -hmm. Discuss the medical error to the patient. Do you all agree? Yes. Yep. Offer disclosure to the patient. Right. Even though. A sentinel event does not occur. Even though harm does not occur to the patient, you always disclose the error. D. D, it's in Delta. No penalties incurred against the resident physician. Do you all agree? Well, wouldn't this be a good Samaritan law? So I would, I guess I would say D as well. Okay, good. Good Samaritan laws. Could you tell me what are those laws? Like the good Samaritan law, what does it imply? What's it, what, what does it say? So it precludes you liability, right? In doing something, in saving someone else's lives. For example, someone had a heart attack on the street and you help, you perform CPR. And during that, um, the performance of the CPR, you had a broken ribs, you are, by law, you are not liable for that um, damage, okay? So everyone is saying it's D, no penalties incurred against the Resident physician. Why is an emergency? You can say, right? Mm -hmm. Do we all agree? And the answer is yep, actually D. Good Samaritan laws. Excellent. They offer legal protection to people who give medical aid to anyone who is injured or otherwise incapacitated, right? So, why do we have Good Samaritan laws? This is meant to lessen someone's reluctance to help, okay? Under no circumstances should civil and criminal penalties be incurred if physicians act within their area of competency, perform only standard procedures, and stay with the patient until relieved by a competent medical personnel and receive no compensation for services offered. So a legal protection for you to anyone who is injured, ill, or in danger. Excellent. Next. Uh, this is an easy question. This is an iffy one. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you imagine a resident, you as the <laughs> resident telling the attending surgeon that you do not think the patient is a good candidate for intubation and that you know better than the attending surgeon. <laughs> so the actions are best described as what? Insubordination. Easy. What is this? B. In subordination, of course. So the resident is making a biased decision not to follow orders. This is an example of insubordination, defined as 
defiance of authority or refusal to obey orders. Remember, it is necessary to perform a primary survey upon receiving a patient. So you need to, you need to check patient's airway, breathing, circulation, right? A, B, C, D. And airway obstruction is one of the major cause of death. So you need to intubate the patient. Um, term four or term five, I don't know if, if they're still um, doing the advanced um, cardiovascular life support, the ACLS, do that one. It's very, very helpful. It's also good in your resume when you go to the hospital. ACLS. What's the difference between obedience and insubordination? What's the difference between? So obedience, you obey. Right? Mm -hmm. Insubordination, you are in a hierarchy. Okay. You're in a hierarchy, and which one is higher, you or the attending surgeon? The surgeon. You are the resident or the attending physician, the attending surgeon. The attending surgeon is higher than you, and he orders you to do something, right? Mm -hmm. But you said no. But in this case, that intervention is necessary in order for the patient to live. Right? You need to intubate the patient. And you said in the vignette, you said, no, I don't think that it's a good candidate. And you know better than the physician. Okay. It's in subordination. Okay? Make, make sure you don't do that in your rotations, <laughs> guys, or it will be like, um, it will be a long, long internship. Trust me on that. <laughs> Make sure be always um, always be at the, on the good side of your attending yeah? when you go next year when you go to um, rotations, your clinical. Ah. This is becoming controversial in our society, right? You have um, a, a person who has a deep religious belief, right? And he's resisting this medical intervention. What do you think? What should the clinician do in this situation? Five-year-old emergency, emergency. D. Motor vehicle emergency, right? Emergency. They seek the parents and they say the parents, no, I refuse it. Because of our religious beliefs. What should you do? Someone is saying D. D, Delta. Take the child to surgery and provide, but why? Why D? Because it's <clears throat> it'll be a life saving procedure, no? And they can't sorry. So do you all agree it's D? Yes. Yes. I hear some hesitation in your voice. See. Yes or no? C is in yes. Yes. What is the answer? <laughs> D. Yes or no? D, correct? Right? Okay. Three, two, one. It is D. Remember, even though it is an emergency. <laughs> I was speaking <laughs> Spanish. Oh. Right? So remember, in an emergency situation, surgery and blood transfusions are medically necessary. Even though the parents object, even though you have a religious objection to that, it's an emergency. You have a duty to treat, right? Parents do not have the authority to refuse life-saving treatment. Remember that one. For their children. Why not go for a court order for a blood transfusion or asking to speak to an elder? of the faith. It would delay treatment. Remember, this is emergency situation, right? How about proceeding to surgery without blood transfusion? It would jeopardize the child's well-being. It's not unacceptable, okay? So what's the high yield point here? Parents do not have authority to refuse life-saving treatment for their children, okay? We're almost there. 10 more minutes before we're done. <clears throat>
B. B as in boy or D as in delta? B as in beta? Okay, so contact Child Protective. Where do you think you should contact the Child Protective Services? B as in Bella. Bella. Okay, B as in Bella Hadid. Excellent. So, <laughs> so where do you think you should contact the Child Protective Services? Suspected child abuse. Suspect child abuse. Is there anything in the vignette that's, that you can say, mm, this is a definite sign of child abuse? Is there anything in the vignette? Look at the vignette. I would say them being apprehensive about admitting her to the hospital when you found something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone? Look at the vignette. Is it D? D? I'm saying why D? Because it's under age, right? Four years old, right? Anything? Any other answers? Look at the vignette carefully, please. Well, there's no family history of seizures. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The patient is what? Playful. There is no visible injuries. Immunizations are up to date. Right? Look at the physical exam. Bilateral pale conjunctiva. What are we thinking? Bilateral pale conjunctiva. And the palpable, the choroidal veins are exposed. I talked to you about this term one. The choroidal veins are exposed. And the palpable unilateral abdominal mass on the left. Her parents are apprehensive about having her admitted to the hospital. What are we thinking? So someone is saying B. Someone is saying D. Okay, anything else? Uno, dos, tres. The answer is... D. So here, a four-year-old girl presents to the ED with her parents after having her first seizure, despite the fact that the patient appears playful, right? And you have concerning physical exam findings. Collectively, the symptoms may indicate the presence of a Wilms tumor or an abdominal neoplasm. You're going to learn this in term four, neuroblastoma, Oh, no, I, I think term five about the brain. Neuroblastoma or Wilms um, tumor. So he, in this case, the patient needs further evaluation to assess the mass and etiology of anemia. So you need to offer laboratory and imaging studies. So the next step in management would be obtain consent from the patient's parents. Why not child abuse? Why not child abuse? Someone is saying contact child protective service. Why not child abuse in the vignette? Why not that one? Maybe no visible injuries and the child seems playful. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. That, that's, that's, that's a good one. So the patient appears playful. The patient is not um, fearful, right? That's a good one. And you have a look at the signs and um, symptoms. You have no stages of healing, right? If you have any lesions, so that's different stages of um, healing. All right. Next one, Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones calling Dr. Jones. So you have a patient, you're interviewing the patient, and the patient says, I can't stand Dr. Smith. He is a lousy surgeon, and he doesn't know how to treat people. Next time you see him, tell him he has made his patients extremely angry and should learn how to become a better doctor. So what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? E. B as in boy? No, E as in exam. E as an echo. So I am sorry that you had a bad experience. I hope that I can better address your needs today. Okay. Any other answers? I was C. thinking C. 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 Mm -hmm. I understand you're upset, but I suggest you speak directly to Dr. Smith regarding your concerns. Okay. Why you why C? What makes it attractive? C. Don't you want to encourage um, patient doctor like Okay. Talking directly to one another 
about their concerns? Uh, for those person who, who picks um, E, why do you think that's attractive? The person who picked um, E. I was thinking just because like you're acknowledging that oh, you're upset, but then trying to like improve their like viewpoint of treatment, I guess. Okay, all right. So any other answers? No? Uh, do, trois. See, I understand you are upset, but I suggest you speak directly to Dr. Smith regarding your concerns, right? If the patient is uncomfortable doing so, he or she should be given information about how to contact or meet with the hospital's patient's advocate who can address the concerns. But for you, you need to acknowledge the patient's concern acknowledge the concern and ask the patient to address those concerns directly to the physician involved okay it is important what's the what's the high yield here it is important to acknowledge the patient's concerns okay don't spill the tea on your fellow physician all right next question This is our last question. I need to go and eat my lunch. Sorry, guys. It's three o'clock. What are we thinking here? A. You ask the physician. So you diagnose the patient. And the patient asks the physician the, not to tell his wife or children. Remember, it is the patient who asks you not to tell his wife. Someone is saying, A, you ask why he doesn't want to discuss his diagnosis with the family. So you're eliciting more information from the patient. Any other answers? This is the last question. I have more, but you can read them, right? So it's A, all of you agree? It is A. So this patient has lung malignancy. Why? Because the patient actually asks you, right? Patient's autonomy. He asks you not to tell your wife or children. All right, everyone. Hopefully this review helps you in your exam. I'm gonna post the thing on the chat. I'm going to post the PowerPoints on the chat right Thank now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's on the chat, the PowerPoint. I hope you can.